Today, I wanted to talk about a really exciting paper that just came out that takes us just a little bit closer to answering the question about the origin of life on planet Earth. The paper that focuses on a very famous proposition known as the RNA world. But intriguingly, in this case, this is not just some kind of a hypothetical proposition or some kind of a theory, this is an experiment. And that's why it's really exciting, because the experimental evidence from this is really unexpected and presents us with very exciting conclusions. But before we talk about the paper and what exactly was discovered, I obviously have to do a bit of an introduction when it comes to this topic. Oh, and also, I guess, myself, in case this is your first time here. How wonderful person, this is Anton. Today, we're going to discuss the origin of life and what the researchers discovered in the last month or so, and actually talk about three separate papers, all of which you can find in the description below. And so, in order to figure out how life potentially started on planet Earth, most of the research has actually been focusing on either finding fossils, which by the way is extremely difficult because here we're talking about something that's 4 billion years old, or trying to create experiments that might potentially provide experimental evidence. But based on previous research, Today we know that at least 3.5 to maybe 3.8 billion years ago, something happened on our planet, definitively changing the activity here from abiotic, or basically not related to life, to biotic, or biotic chemistry, where a lot of chemical reactions were suddenly biological in nature and influenced by a lot of ancient life. A lot of biological systems, very likely bacterial in nature, that suddenly started to change our planet in a lot of different ways. But we don't actually know what happened before that. There are a lot of different theories trying to explain how all of this started or how bacteria came to be, but at the moment most of this is just speculation and there's definitely a lack of experiments in order to prove these ideas. But a while back, in one of the previous studies, the researchers conducted an experiment with a nickel-based protein, a protein that was able to perform a very similar role to various molecules responsible for metabolism today. Now, this particular protein was created in a lab as part of the experiment, but the result showed us that it's possible for very simple proteins to perform very complex roles that are usually performed by complex enzymes in modern organisms. In other words, it showed us that a lot of these complex proteins we have today very likely had extremely modest origins and potentially started from something extremely simple. In this case, this relatively simple synthetic protein was able to use nickel and iron to act like an enzyme, but more intriguingly, it performed in conditions potentially very similar to primordial Earth. Earth that was very likely extremely hot, filled with a lot of metals on the surface, and was entirely different from how it is today. And so during this time, it's quite likely that a lot of these early proteins started to develop and started to potentially become more complex, laying the foundation for some of the first life to evolve. And this started approximately 4.4 billion years ago, when the Earth was still pretty hot. But it did cool down relatively quickly, and we know that 3.8 billion years ago, there were already signs of complex life on the surface. And recently, one of the other papers focused on some of the rocks coming from this period, roughly around 3.4 to 3.5 billion years ago. These are the rocks from South Africa, and they actually show us how ancient microorganisms potentially sustain themselves and how they survived during those times. This is actually coming from the Barberton Greenstone Belt, a location in South Africa that contains some of the oldest preserved rocks on the surface of the planet, and it's actually believed to be a remnant of an ancient shallow sea that was very likely surrounded by volcanic islands. And here, a lot of the rocks seem to contain a lot of blobs of carbon-based matter, which represent remnants of various microorganisms very likely ancient bacteria living in the oceans or living in these shallow seas back in the days. But here it's actually possible to analyze the chemical makeup of all of this in order to determine what sort of a metabolism these ancient organisms very likely used. There seem to be a lot of signs of organisms potentially using photosynthesis, or basically using light from the sun to create various sugars. And based on this analysis, the researchers believe there was actually a tremendous amount of various photosynthetic bacteria living on the surface of the sea that existed over 3.4 billion years ago. But some organisms present here potentially used other types of carbon, and so they were not photosynthetic. Some of the samples contain less carbon-12 and more carbon-13, which suggests they were probably feeding on various chemicals, which then changed their composition and produced slightly different observations inside these samples. 
And in this case, they most likely resided somewhere on the bottom of the sea and thus represented slightly different bacteria. But in terms of numbers, they were definitely not as numerous. But the most exciting discovery coming out of these samples is just the fact that early life was potentially doing very similar things back in the days as it pretty much does today, at least in the oceans. So even though a lot of things on Earth did change, in terms of overall activity, and specifically photosynthesis, or using complex organic molecules for survival and for energy has not changed that much in at least three and a half billion years. But what about before that? And here I guess we go to that original question. Even though about 3.5 to 3.8 billion years ago, something on Earth very likely changed, we don't actually know what happened right before that and how these early organisms evolved as well. Now, if 3.5 billion years ago there was already so much complexity, it only suggests that this type of life very likely existed for at least several hundred million years already. But we just don't have old enough samples to see further back in time. And so even though technically we can use DNA to trace the history of evolution all the way back to some of these early organisms, we have no idea what happened before that or how DNA evolved as well. And that's where this recent paper comes in to try to fill in some of these blanks. When it comes to the origin of life on the planet, most researchers don't actually think it started with DNA. Now, DNA by itself is actually really intriguing, intriguing because it's basically specialized to store information and is also relatively stable and even has a way to kind of fix itself, but it's extremely unlikely that DNA was the first to come. Just because it needs so much other stuff in order to function and in order to drive the activity inside various cells. And so instead, a lot of researchers have officially been subscribed to the idea known as the RNA world, also referred to as RNA world hypothesis. Originally proposed back in the 60s by the researcher Alexander Rich and Walter Gilbert, who later coined the term in the 80s. With the idea being really simple, RNA might have been the first on Earth and might have functioned like primitive life, very likely conducting all of the function in a typical cell without the need for anything else. And there is quite a lot of evidence for this idea that's extremely difficult to argue with. For example, just like DNA, RNA can easily store and replicate genetic information. So technically you don't even need DNA. If things are really simple, RNA is more than enough. But DNA is just more complex and obviously allows us to create something much larger and so it is more efficient. Likewise, like different types of proteins and enzymes, RNA can be an enzyme or perform functions of a small protein. For example, inside different cells, it often acts like a catalyst, dramatically increasing various chemical reactions that are usually critical for life. But it does have one major difference, or I guess one major disadvantage. It's not stable. And it's not very durable either. In contrast, DNA is very stable and even has its own way to repair itself which is probably why eventually it became the predominant way of storing genetic information. Whereas when it comes to enzymes and different types of proteins, they very likely replaced RNA eventually just because there is a lot more abundance and diversity in them and also because they can generally grow much more complex. And so this brand new research that just came out presents an extremely important evidence based on an experiment. Technically, this is actually first ever experimental evidence for the idea known as RNA world. Now, as always, you can find the paper in the description below, but in a nutshell, what the researchers were able to achieve here is to basically create an RNA enzyme that doesn't just create copies, copies of other functional RNA strands. It also seems to be able to evolve things, allowing new variants of the molecules to emerge as a result. And here we even have a video that kind of shows us how all of this worked. And so here, an RNA strand nicknamed hammerhead, or basically a tiny molecule that's able to cleave RNA molecules into pieces, is being copied over and over. But the surprise came from the fact that the RNA polymerase ribosome didn't just copy functional hammerheads, it also sort of evolved them over time, creating variations after just a few generations. And these new variations of hammerhead had very similar function, but some of them were slightly easier to replicate in some sense showing us evolutionary fitness. And actually some of them eventually became the, I guess, dominant species or the dominant RNA molecules. In essence, making this a groundbreaking experiment when it comes to evolution of life and our attempt to create RNA-based life in lab conditions. And so here, because this is all based on RNA polymerase ribosome, an actual RNA molecule that can make copies using other RNA strands, this definitively shows us that RNA world 
may not be as far-fetched as we previously believed. And it also suggests that some of the earliest forms of evolution may have actually occurred because of RNA molecules and on this very tiny molecular scale with all of this happening extremely fast. Basically suggesting that RNA could have been the origin of life on the planet. And for the researchers behind this paper, this is a huge breakthrough. They've actually been trying to create this for a long time, but all of their previous attempts always had one small mistake. The accuracy of replication was extremely low, and so over many generations, the RNA strands would become completely useless and no longer resemble the original sequence. But this newly created RNA molecule seems to be different. It seems to copy everything with very high accuracy, even creating a kind of a evolutionary pressure. But it still lacks one important thing. It cannot actually reproduce itself. And that's basically the goal for some of the next studies. Creating some kind of an RNA polymerase that can then replicate itself without anything. Which would definitively prove that RNA world can definitely happen, and obviously happen on other planets as well, with very similar conditions to early Earth. But the main conclusion from the study is basically that early evolution could have happened extremely early and could have been extremely simple. It did not require any major complexity, and all of this could have been done by relatively simple molecules, just a few amino acids in size. And then, due to various types of selection pressure, they would eventually improve themselves, become more complex, very likely become differentiated, and then at some point, somehow created early cells. But how exactly they created that, that's a question we're not going to be tackling yet. But we will tackle in a video very soon, because there is a study on that that just came out as well. I just don't want to put all of this in the same video. And so, if you want to learn more, make sure to subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else. Thank you for watching, support the channel on Patreon by joining a channel membership, or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.